Hi, I'm Nick Redding, Executive Director of Preservation Maryland, and I'm joined here today with Ellie Comers Cowan, our Director of Engagement at Preservation Maryland. And uh, we were the folks on the ground representing the organization over the past several months in Annapolis uh, as we moved through the 2018 session of the Maryland General Assembly. That session came to an end on Monday as the clock struck midnight. And so we're here to give you a full report on what happened for historic preservation um, over the course of those three months. Uh, in the, the uh, link in this uh, live video, you can actually get a full readout of the entire report that we've put together on what happened for preservation. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the bills that actually passed, and then I'm going to pass it along to Ellie for the not-so-good news, which the bills that didn't pass. <laughs> Um, so one of the big exciting things that happened is we passed House Bill uh, 1454 thanks to the support of uh, Senator Bill Ferguson and Delegate Alonzo Washington, the two primary sponsors of this legislation, where we were able to get it through just in the nick of time. It passed uh, on sine die. Uh, and this piece of legislation does a couple different things that are pretty exciting. If a historic preservation project that is taking advantage of the state historic tax credit also results in affordable housing, that project will now be eligible for a 5% additional credit. So instead of 20%, it will be eligible for 25%. Uh, and we see this as an important victory for preservation because we wanna be a part of solutions that our communities uh, need. And there is a critical need for affordable housing here in the state of Maryland. And we know that uh, historic buildings can play uh, an important role in meeting that need. So that's pretty exciting. It also repeals a prohibition, um, which is a little wonky, it says that you can't uh, go back multiple times for tax credits on functionally related structures. Basically what this will, will do is it will open up the ability to uh, tackle complex projects at campus-like structures. So uh, large hospital complexes. Um, one of our pro former Six to Fix projects, the Glendale Hospital, is a perfect example of this in Prince George's County. So this will allow developers to tackle these complex campus-like projects in a phased fashion. And then the other thing that we work to put in is a, uh, an amendment that will make it so that if a project doesn't move forward, let's say it's awarded tax credits initially, but for one reason or another it doesn't move forward, Currently, under current law, that money goes back to the general fund. It doesn't go back to the program. The legislation that we put in will make it so that that goes back to the program, and that could be to the benefit of the program of nearly a million dollars a year. Uh, so significant savings and, and uh, really good for the historic tax credit program. Of course, all these bills that we're talking about still require the governor's signature. Um, so we're waiting for those, but we expect that to happen soon. Um, HB 877 is an exciting one. This is the first major piece of cemetery legislation that has moved forward since the 1990s. Um, and it is gonna provide for cemetery access. Um, so if a, a descendant wants to visit a cemetery, currently there's uh, no law that says they have to be given access. This provides that access. It sets up an opportunity for the Maryland Historical Trust to help comment and um, assist people who own historic cemeteries with how to take care of their historic headstones. And it also, for the first time, enables a local tax credit for uh, historic cemeteries. So it allows localities to set up a tax credit program for people to take care of historic cemeteries, which would be a first here in Maryland. So pretty exciting. Um, Senate Bill 983, which was introduced by uh, Pre President of the Senate, Mike Miller, um, establishes $250,000 in museum grant funding, which is going to be administered by the Maryland Historical Trust. So we are so excited to see $250,000 going out every year for museum grants. And, and that is gonna be run by the Maryland Historical Society. Uh, and so um, stay tuned and, and, and look to them for more information on when they start giving out those $250,000 in grants. Um, the other thing that, that was uh, provided, there is a, a document called the Joint Chairman's Report. And in that report, the different houses, the Senate and the House, were able to request reports on uh, items and issues that they wanted to learn more about. Um, and included in this year's Joint Chairman's Report was a request for information from the Maryland Historical Trust about their easement program, about the history of the program, the administration of the program, potential future of the program, 
Uh, it's a program that never has enough staff. And so this is an opportunity for the Maryland Historical Trust to explain the program, talk about ways in which they want to administer it into the future, ways to make it more effective, and also how to deal with declining state support for it. Uh, so we're looking forward to that and intend on, on participating in that. So that's some of the very good news about legislation in the past. Now I'm going to pass it over to Ellie for the not so good news about what didn't pass. <laughs> um, so yes, Debbie Downer here. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the bills that we at Preservation Maryland worked with, again, uh, Senator Bill Ferguson and Delegate Alonzo Washington on was uh, SB 481 and HB 954, and that was to increase funding to our uh, state historic tax credit, the Heritage Structure Rehabilitation Tax Credit. Um, that program is uh, currently funded at $9 million to be split uh, across the entire state. This is for the large competitive commercial tax credit program, so these big um, catalytic projects that can are, are wonderful for community revitalization, they're job creators, only funded at $9 million uh, with a $3 million pro per project cap, uh, so ostensibly only three projects could go forward each year with these credits. Um, these bills would have increased uh, the funding to that program to $15 million, a modest Six million dollar increase. Um, unfortunately, uh, those they did not move forward in either house. Um, just for a little comparison, uh, our neighbors to the south in Virginia are doing about a hundred million dollars a year in tax credits. So uh, we're not even ten percent there. Uh, also, in um, Massachusetts and Wisconsin, which are states similar in population size and budget to Maryland, they're doing about fifty million dollars in these credits. So. Maryland is, is falling way behind um, and you know this is uh, such a strong credit it returns more to the state coffers than it costs uh, it, it's it's a really smart tax credit um, so although it didn't pass this year we'll be back again next year and every session after that until we can get full funding for this program um, the second bill that we worked on um, was HB 1408 which is a um, uh, historic districts and flooding bill. Uh, originally, Preservation Maryland came out against this bill because of the vague wording, uh, uh, the language in the bill. Um, what it stated was that uh, local legislative bodies could deviate from historic preservation standards in historic districts that were um, subject to repeat flooding that showed some sort of threat to life or safety. Um, and although the intent of the bill was specifically for historic Ellicott City, who suffered the devastating flood of 2016, um, the language of the bill was was too vague and could have been applicable to many um, many non-tidal flooding uh, incidents in historic districts across the state. So we worked with Delegate um, Bob Flanagan, who was the bill's sponsor. Uh, we worked with him to amend it into a, a study bill. Um, that would have established an Ellicott City flood work group with many different interested parties from the preservation community, from uh, Ellicott City itself, from the Army Corps of Engineers um, to really figure out the best way to forward with flood mitigation in that historic district. Unfortunately, that did not pass by the end of session, um, but we are looking forward to working with Delegate Flanagan and. Um, it's establishing a work group without the legislation, um, it's not necessary to do that. So we're really excited um, to be working with him uh, in the future on that. So in terms of the actual funding, um, so we talked about legislation that passed and didn't pass, but there was uh, some good news in terms of funding for historic preservation. So our non-capital grant program, which Preservation Maryland was pleased to bring back after um, a long dry spell, nearly 10 years, last year came in at 200,000. This year we were able to increase it to $300,000 for non-capital grants. So this is for survey and research of architectural resources. It can pay for archeology, span it can pay for planning, uh, it can pay for uh, you know, programming. Um, so we're really excited to see an increase level of funding for that. The capital grant program, which also we were able to work to bring back last year after a very long dry spell um, with no funding, is back again with level funding at $600,000, which is fantastic news. The African American Heritage Grant program is level funded, fully funded at a million dollars. 
um, which is significant and really important. The heritage areas, um, because of legislation that was passed last year, which we supported, um, have increased their funding by $3 million, so they are up to full $6 million in funding, which is fantastic news for our state heritage areas. Um, unfortunately, as Ellie mentioned, the State Historic Tax Credit remains levelly funded at $9 million, uh, which is just less than 10% of what Virginia is able to put into theirs every year, but we're, uh, as Ellie said, expect to hear from us every year uh, until we can get funding up from this. We, uh, you have not heard the end of us on state historic <laughs> tax credits. Not at all. And then the other exciting thing, Preservation Maryland participates as a part of the executive committee of the Partners for Open Space. Um, and I have the opportunity to chair uh, the Partners for Open Space Executive Committee. And so we do a lot of work on program open space. And we are so enthused to see that this year, Governor Hogan and the Maryland General Assembly uh, stayed true to their promise and legislation that was passed a few years back there's full funding of program open space. We don't even know how long it's been since we've seen full funding of program open space. A $67 million increase over last year for open space preservation, historic preservation, um, state parks, you name it. Um, if you love it and it's outdoors, program open space has probably paid for it. And we are so pleased to see that massive increase of funding for program open space. So very good news. And then one other piece of news on the bond bill front, which Ellie's going to yes. mention. Um, so Nick mentioned earlier our six to fix program. And last year, um, our, our, our class of six to fix projects included the uh, Liberty Crane at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And if you've ever been to this wonderful museum, it's the large crane that greets you uh, at, the, at the front of the museum. Um, and it's, uh, it is in desperate need of, of some repairs and some maintenance. Um, and so the Muse Baltimore Museum of Industry received a $225,000 bond bill to uh, address some of those repairs um, and, and really uh, uh, make that crane uh, part of the Baltimore skyline, much like you know the, the Baltimore uh, Domino Sugar sign or the Natty Bow Man. So um, we're really happy about that. Pretty exciting to see that happen. And I think at the end of the day, the exciting thing about all of this is none of it would have been possible without the support of our constituents. You know, Ellie and I are on the ground um, and making the connections and holding the meetings and providing testimony, but we're backed up by hundreds of preservation advocates all around the state. Um, over a hundred of them came out for our advocacy day this year, which was a huge success. We did it in partnership with the American Institute of Architects. Um, and that was really fantastic to have them out there on the same day as the Maryland Historical Trust Awards. So we had a huge contingency of people in Annapolis. And it wasn't just that day, it was all throughout session. And that is what is making the difference. The difference uh, isn't just Preservation Maryland, we are just bringing people together. The difference is the people out in, in the communities who are making the case with their legislators. And the proof is in these programs which are seeing increased funding, getting legislation passed which makes preservation possible. Um, and we are so appreciative to all of our supporters out there. So as we mentioned, um, there's a full report in the link associated with this post. Um, and if you're so inclined, we'd love for you to make a donation to our advocacy fund, which makes all of this work possible. Uh, the return on investment you can see is in the millions of dollars. Um, so any gift would be very appreciated. And thank you for your support of preservation advocacy. Uh, stay tuned because we'll be back. It's a year round effort and it takes both our work and the work of our supporters out there to make this possible. So thank you so much thank for supporting you. Preservation Maryland.